Funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years, and Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Finozzi. Good evening and thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Rhonda Schaffler, in for Brianna Venozzi. First Lady Jill Biden makes her first official visit to New Jersey to promote the latest COVID relief package known as the American Rescue Plan, touring an elementary school in Burlington County and telling teachers there the nation is beginning to see the light at the end of the tunnel. This on a day when thousands of additional residents became eligible to receive their COVID-19 vaccines, including teachers and school staff. The state reporting it has now exceeded 3 million total vaccines given, and more than 1 million people have gotten either their second dose or J&J's one-shot vaccine, meaning about 12% of the state's population is now fully vaccinated. In terms of who is now eligible to receive a vaccine, in addition to teachers, the state says several other groups can get vaccinated, including public and local transportation workers, public safety workers like probation officers and fire safety inspectors, migrant farm workers, and those living in homeless shelters. In several of New Jersey's cities today, there was a big push to get educators vaccinated. Many communities want to get children back into the classrooms, especially as we approach Thursday's one-year anniversary of the state order to shut down our schools. So as senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports, in both Jersey City and Patterson, they set up vaccine sites in the schools. As long as I get my two vaccines in, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. I'm not worried. And so this high school English teacher lined up with colleagues in Jersey City to get a COVID vaccination. School staff across New Jersey today joined the state's list of those eligible for the vaccine, and Jersey City's dedicating all 5,000 doses of its available Moderna vaccine to educators and staff all this week in an effort to reopen classrooms for in-person learning. There's a, a connection to my students that you can't get online, and... Um, I would like to get things back to so-called normal. I already had COVID, but I still want to be protected and I don't want to, uh, you know, I don't want to transmit it to anyone else because it was horrible when I did have it. From, you know, the city standpoint, we wanted to make sure that there's no reason or excuse that we can't go back to in-person learning. Mayor Steve Phillips says about 1,500 school staffers have signed up for shots here. That's out of some 4,700. The district's 30,000 students have been remote learning for almost a year, and April 22nd is the target date set by Jersey City Superintendent to reopen for face-to-face -face instruction. Teachers have said that they don't feel comfortable without the vaccine. So we've allocated 100% of our doses this week to teachers to make sure that there is no reason on April 22nd that we can't open the schools for in-person learning. We should have the demand outweighing supply and uh, you know we don't see that yet. Teacher unions in major urban districts are divided over whether every teacher needs to be vaccinated before schools can reopen for in-person learning. Vaccine hesitancy is a major issue. Everyone has their, their own opinion of it and and you know how um, some people just still don't think that it's real. I have a phobia about needles so I would prefer the one shot instead of the two shot. And so you're not going to take a Moderna? If I had to, I would. But Community Center aid Ernestine Gordon's going to hold out for the one-shot J&J. She's on a waiting list. Meanwhile, Patterson obtained 650 vaccine appointment slots for its teachers. Only 1,500 of some 3,900 staffers have signed up so far, and the district will get vaccine for whoever wants it. They've been giving this opportunity to us, to the teachers, to the assistants, to everyone. I think we should take it. Teachers are coming from, you know, other state, other um, towns, you know, into our our city. And so I do believe it's important for teachers to get vaccinated. It's important that everyone that's going to enter our school building 
uh, has an opportunity if they would like to get uh, vaccinated. We're also going to have air purifiers in every single room in our buildings. Patterson will decide April 14th when to reopen. They're keeping an eye on the rate of transmission and community spread with a target date of May 3rd to reopen for in-person learning. In Newark, the union's not insisting every one of its 4,000 teachers get vaccinated as officials launch a district staff vaccination drive tomorrow. But they're strongly urging members. All the more important that if you're in a closed classroom, that you be vaccinated, at the very least tested regularly, which is what we're asking the parents and the community to do. Union leaders voiced continuing concern over community spread. COVID infection rates soared in Newark last fall. Now the district must determine how it can safely move students back into classrooms and hit its tentative April 12th reopening target as schools statewide struggle to vaccinate and reopen. I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. Governor Murphy says federal support for the state's vaccination effort will quicken the pace of inoculations. That support is found in the new COVID relief package, which provides billions in aid for the state and local governments. This week, President Joe Biden, the First Lady, and members of his administration are traveling to several states to promote the American Rescue Plan in what's being billed as the Help is Here Tour. For First Lady Jill Biden, the tour included a visit to Burlington County today. Raven Santana has our report. Today, I'm here to tell you, with the American Rescue Plan, help is here. Help is here. That's the motto for the Biden administration, which embarked on a cross-country tour to sell the COVID-19 relief plan. First Lady Joe Biden came to the Garden State, promising the plan will jumpstart the economy and help reopen Jersey schools like Burlington County, which took a beating during the pandemic. So we're excited to have the money to use for our extended school year summer program. You know, we want kids back in person for the summer, so they're learning you know, with teachers in the classroom. And, you know, we're also looking for after school programs, additional counseling to support social emotional learning as well. This afternoon, the First Lady traveled to Samuel Smith Elementary School in Burlington County to join Governor Phil Murphy to greet students while learning about the COVID-19 mitigation strategies implemented in the school. There can be no recovery without a place for working parents to send their children. The First Lady touted the $1.9 trillion plan, which provides $1,400 per person checks to households across America, housing and nutrition assistance, and access to safe and reliable childcare and affordable health care. The stimulus package signed by the president last week includes more than $2.7 billion for Jersey public schools. Of that, $138 million is earmarked for programs to address learning loss, $28 million for summer enrichment, $28 million is for after-school programs, and more than $73 million is targeted to non-public schools in the state. New Jersey schools have, you know, are doing pretty well out of this, but they've had some tough times with state aid over the last couple of years, at least some districts have, and this eases a lot of that pain for sure. You know, there, there's certainly going to be some tutoring there's a fair amount, I'm sure, going to be going to mental health programs. Um, so yes, it's bodies. It's, um, you know, it's, it's hours in the day that they're trying to make up. But a, a big chunk of this money is also going to go towards providing, you know, safety and, and health requirements. Director of the Monmouth University Polling Institute, Patrick Murray, says for the Biden administration to be successful, they need to sell this plan. I think it's really interesting that they skipped the usual rollout kind of media events, such as these Sunday morning talk shows, and they're going out to places like Burlington, uh, New Jersey, uh, to talk to real voters. I think it's really exciting that she's taken time out of her schedule to come to a, a regular average everyday neighborhood and talk to people and, um, you know, it, make her presence felt for the rest of us. I'm all for everybody getting a little money in their pocket, but I think it's really just going to, you know, kind of help coast the economy through, you know, especially people waiting on their taxes to come back, you know, with COVID and everything and everybody kind of being in and out of work, you know, jobs, you know, places closing, jobs cutting hours. I think it's just a great way to kind of put some extra money in the pockets of all of the Americans. There are a couple of uh, problems with, with uh, businesses reopening, particularly service businesses like restaurants, gyms and those kinds of things schools, which is where we see Jill Biden going to. Uh, so, you know, those are the things that they're going to really try to sell hard. 
and show that they can they can deliver on. Um, but right now they need to get people excited about that and see the promise, connect to those checks that they really like to the other aspects of the bill too, to basically give people the sense of optimism that uh, the country as a whole is on the road to recovery. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Raven Santana. The Murphy administration touts its transparency in sharing COVID-19 information, including its daily data report, which today saw nearly 2,500 new positive cases and 23 more lives lost. But the Murphy administration hasn't been entirely transparent about its pandemic efforts, according to a report. The Associated Press says the administration has responded slowly to public records requests from the media for information about decision making and spending. And in some cases, the administration has denied requests. For example, the AP sought reports related to an executive order calling for hospitals and nursing homes to disclose their capacity and supplies during the COVID-19 outbreak. That request was denied with the administration citing a 2005 law that says reports and other records made during an emergency are not considered public. The AP also says broad requests about spending have been answered, but some information has been withheld from the public. Last week, Governor Murphy said it may take some time to release certain records, but that his administration is committed to transparency. Two men originally from New Jersey have been arrested for assaulting Capitol Hill police officer and South River native Brian Sicknick, but they are not charged with his death. Federal authorities charged Jillian Cater and George Tanios with assaulting Sicknick with bear spray during the January 6th riots in Washington, D.C. Authorities have not determined whether the exposure led to the officer's death. Cater was arrested yesterday as he got off a plane at Newark Liberty Airport. He currently lives in Somerset, according to his LinkedIn page. Tanios now operates a sandwich shop in West Virginia. The men were charged with nine counts, including assaulting three officers with a deadly weapon. They could face up to 20 years in prison. Last May, a black man named Maurice Gordon Jr. was fatally shot by a New Jersey state trooper during a routine traffic stop. Gordon's family is now suing the state, alleging race was a factor in his death, which came two days before George Floyd was killed in Minneapolis, setting off nationwide demonstrations over police brutality. Leah Mishkin reports on the allegations in the lawsuit and all of the unanswered questions surrounding Gordon's death. We still don't have an autopsy report. We still don't have the toxicology report. It's been almost a year since Maurice Gordon Jr. was allegedly shot and killed on the Garden State Parkway by a New Jersey State Trooper after being pulled over for allegedly speeding. The family's attorney, William Wagstaff, says they still don't have all the pieces needed to paint a full picture of the 28-year-old's final moments. We still don't have much of the information about any of the officers that arrived at the scene. Don't have any body camera from them if they had it on because Sergeant Wetzel did not. We don't have any audio recordings. What was released in June of 2020 by the Attorney General's office shows scenes leading up to the shooting, like this one of the Dutchess Community College chemistry student in the back of the trooper's car waiting for a tow truck. The reason you're in my car is because you, you keep jumping out. We're in a real bad spot. We're on the side of the highway here. If you look behind us, there's cars every. You know what I mean? I don't want you getting hit. I'm trying to help you out. Your car died. I don't know. It, it, did you run out of gas? The situation quickly escalates when the state trooper offers Gordon Jr. a mask, and he ultimately gets out of the car. At no point did the officer tell him that he was under arrest. So for all intents and purposes, Maurice Gordon Jr. should have been free to return to his vehicle. Even if Officer Wetzel felt that there may have been a safety concern, which is legitimate, that could have been handled differently. Attorney Wagstaff says the case has still not been sent to the grand jury, and he's still waiting for evidence from the attorney general's office. That's why on March 11, he says he filed a lawsuit on behalf of Gordon's family against the state of New Jersey, State Trooper Sergeant Randall Wetzel, Attorney General Gabriel Graywall, New Jersey State Police Colonel Patrick Callahan, and other unnamed individuals. And the causes of action in the federal lawsuit are excessive force, wrongful death, conscious pain and suffering. There were several failures 
by the attorney general's office as well as the head of the state police department and their training and their ability to track the excessive use of force by officers in the state of New Jersey, specifically that excessive use of force when dealing with people of color. In December of 2020, Attorney General Gabir Graywall announced for the first time in more than two decades that the state would be revising its use of force policy, including issuing a ban on all forms of physical and deadly force except as a last resort. The new policy also required all 38,000 officers in New Jersey to complete a two-day de-escalation training by end of 2021 and for any use of force to be logged within 24 hours on a new statewide portal monitored by supervisory officers. I do think that's a step in the right direction. Dr. Jason Williams is an assistant professor of justice studies at Montclair State University. I'm someone who actually does research on this, so I have gone to Ferguson, I've gone to Baltimore following Mike Brown and Freddie Gray. The only way really to remedy some of these behaviors is through consequences on the job. We reached out to New Jersey State Police, but they said they do not comment on pending litigation. The attorney general's office says the criminal case is pending presentation to the grand jury because at present, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, regular grand juries are not sitting and hearing cases. William Wagstaff wants an independent prosecutor to be appointed now that he has named the state attorney general in a civil case. I'm Leah Mishkin. NJ Spotlight News. Governor Murphy has tapped attorney Rachel Wayner Apter to be the next associate justice on the state Supreme Court. Wayner Apter currently serves as director of the New Jersey Division of Civil Rights. She previously worked as a staff attorney for the ACLU and started her career as a clerk for the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Murphy's announcement comes on what would have been Ginsburg's 88th birthday in a Rutgers Hall that bears her name. Murphy's pick would fill the seat of Justice Janie Lavecchia, who announced last week that she would retire at the end of August. Wayner Apter is Murphy's second pick to the state Supreme Court in less than a year. His first selection was Fabiana Pierre-Louis, who became the state's first black female justice when she was sworn in last September. Both women are 40 and could serve up to three decades on the court. New Jersey officially became the 13th state to legalize recreational marijuana on February 22nd, following a tense round of negotiations over penalties for underage use, among other things. But now that pot is legal, it doesn't mean the negotiations are over. Senior correspondent David Cruz takes a look at the next round of cleanup bills. You have to resign yourself to the fact that New Jersey's cannabis industry is a work in progress. When New Jersey voted to legalize cannabis, a lot of people thought they'd be seeing dispensaries and consumption lounges and delivery services by summertime. But the reality appears to be that cannabis demand will exceed legal cannabis supply for most of this year. And it really didn't have to be that way, says a leading Republican whose opposition to legalization was more muted than his caucus. It's a mess. It's a mess at every single step. Uh, and by the way, had they included Republicans, none of this would have been a problem. Uh, you, would, you would not have gone too far in the cleanup bill. The tax structure would have been reasonable. We have on the table, had on the table, uh, perfectly workable solutions for these things. Yet, uh, the Democrats decided to move forward without us. Okay, so now that we know who to blame, what needs fixing in order for this industry to get going? The good news is that technically the Cannabis Regulatory Commission, which is going to make all the rules, is free to start doing that, although no timelines have been set for anything. Meanwhile, there are legislative fixes on the way, cleanup bills, if you will. The first one proposes to fix how police interact with parents when they find their kids smoking weed or drinking in public. The law signed by Murphy prohibits parental notification until there's a second interaction. That had Republicans calling out Democrats for what they said was legalizing cannabis for kids. Senator Vin Gopal is a sponsor of the cleanup bill on parental notification. To not allow a parent or guardian to know what their 15 or 16 year old is doing is pretty uh, insane to me. So. Uh, as soon as, uh, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm mad at myself, and I think other legislators should be mad at themselves that they didn't drill down on this. I'll be honest, I didn't, I missed it. 
Um, the second I learned what it was after, I was like, this has got to change ASAP. The new bill would allow for parental notification immediately. Governor Murphy was asked about the fix recently and gave the kind of guarded endorsement he generally gives to bills that might have enough votes to pass. We'll see where that goes. Um, it's not on my desk. In fact, it's not even through the, the chambers yet, but it's got a ways to go. But as a conceptual matter, I'll put it that way, uh, I, su I support that direction. I don't think this is going to be the only cleanup bill. I think there's going to be others. Yeah, there are, including a fix to how employers treat testing their employees for marijuana use. Senator Paul Sarlo is working on that one, and another bill which the Senate president and legal cannabis OG Nick Scutari are just getting started on addresses the sticky homegrown situation. But it wouldn't allow you to grow your own. It would only get rid of the 20-year penalty for growing it. It's mess, and what we'll have to do is wait, because that's what we do in New Jersey. We screw things up, realize we screw them up, but don't do anything about them until they cause we cause real harm. It's enough to cause general anxiety, which is, ironically, one of the scores of maladies for which you can legally buy medical cannabis today. There's plenty of that, not to mention a good supply of black market weed at the moment. I'm David Cruz, NJ Spotlight News. With all this new federal money heading to the Garden State, has New Jersey's financial picture brightened? I asked NJ Spotlight's John Reitmeyer how the windfall will impact the state's budget. John, how much of a difference will all this federal aid make for the state? Yeah, Rhonda, I think it will make a huge difference in a number of different ways. And so first and foremost is how it helps people. Over $9 billion in stimulus payments go directly to New Jersey residents. That's a huge number, and a lot of people need that money right now. There's also $9 billion plus going to government, whether that's the state government, which is over $6 billion, or county and local governments, which is another more than $3 billion. And then there's almost $3 billion going to New Jersey schools. And so, you know, money for New Jersey transits in here as well, enhanced unemployment benefits, really a significant amount of money that will go a long way toward helping New Jersey residents and helping the pandemic response move forward in New Jersey. So, John, how much has the financial picture changed? Because also last week we got the latest revenue numbers from the state and they looked pretty good, too. Yeah, the, the state's own outlook has really brightened in the last few months from if you think about borrowing, uh, getting over $4 billion from a borrowing issue when the Murphy administration was projecting really bad revenue losses to now being pretty much you know, on target or even, even ahead of target year over year in terms of revenues. And then you're talking about another $6 billion coming in from the federal government to help the stimulate the pandemic response. And so you know, the state's fortunes have changed dramatically now. So, John, how will this change the tone and the discussion around budget hearings that are ongoing? I think, you know, the, the change in tone from years past is New Jersey all of a sudden, you know, has money to do things, make a full pension contribution, fund a lot of programs, increase school aid is, is one of them that maybe didn't have, uh, the state didn't have the money for. I think what you're going to see as the budget hearings continue, however, is there's still all these needs in the community tied to the pandemic. And so it'll be, it'll be figuring out a way to best link this federal aid to those needs in the community and prioritizing where the needs are the most. Do we have a sense yet of the appetite among lawmakers to make uh, significant tweaks in the budget proposal? We're still waiting to hear uh, how much, I mean, usually it's kind of on the edges and, you know, I would expect nothing different this year. I do think lawmakers are going to want to put their print on this budget. We just haven't seen yet exactly how they're going to look to make uh, changes, but probably more along the lines of tweaks than a major overhaul. But a very different picture than what you and I were talking about not that long ago. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> All right, John Reitmeyer, thank you so much. You're welcome. And now here's a check on the Wall Street Trading Day.
support for the business report provided by IBEW Local 102, proudly serving New Jersey's business community since 1900. Local 102, lighting the path, leading the way. Finally tonight, Rutgers fans have reason to celebrate. For the first time in 30 years, the men's basketball team is going to the big dance. The Scarlet Knights heading to the NCAA tournament. The team earned a 10 seed and will play number seven seed Clemson this Friday in Indianapolis. You may recall last year's tournament was canceled due to COVID-19. Head coach Steve Peichel says he's proud of his team for navigating the challenges of COVID-19 and resurrecting the basketball program. That does it for us tonight, but you can head over to njspotlightnews.org or any of our digital platforms to continue following our reporting. I'm Rhonda Schapler, in for Brianna Venosi. For the entire news team, thanks for watching and have a great night. The members of the New Jersey Education Association making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. NJM Insurance Company has been serving New Jersey policyholders for more than 100 years. But just who are NJM's policyholders? They're the men and women who keep the Garden State growing business leaders, the caretakers of our historic landmarks, and the custodians of our public safety. The people who make our state a great place to call home. NJM, we've got New Jersey covered.